At any one time, over half a million people are traveling in the air. 10,000 liters of jet fuel are burnt every second. This accounts for 2% of world CO2 emissions. When you board a plane, what you see are the huge fan blades at the front of the engine, but behind these, the compressor squeezes the cold air to a twentieth of its volume and over 600 degrees centigrade. Then the fuel burns, and that raises the temperature even higher to 1800 degrees just as the gas enters the turbines. The turbine extracts the energy to drive the plane. In the development of a new large civil engine, the most important factors are fuel burn or engine efficiency. And that's important for both the environmental performance, the emissions from the engine, and also the economic performance in terms of the operating costs. In order to make an aero engine more efficient, there are really two factors. There's the propulsive efficiency driven by the fan, and there's the thermodynamic efficiency driven by the core of the engine. So what you really need are lightweight materials for the fan and high temperature, high strength materials in the core of the engine. If you could look into the turbine, it would be glowing white hot. And this minute, half a million people are hanging in the air by metal that should be molten. We're only able to keep the blades solid by clever engineering. We feed cooler air over the surface of the blades and we add ceramic coatings to insulate the metal. To make more efficient engines and to reduce the carbon footprint of flying, we need new materials that can operate at even higher temperatures. Jet engines have always been limited by the performance of the materials and in particular the high temperature materials at the core of the engine. So for Rolls-Royce to remain competitive with competitive products in the marketplace, we must have access to the absolute best materials technology. The work that we do with Cambridge is very technically complex, designing alloys from atoms up and proving their performance for service. We've reached the limit of our existing materials, so this is our grand challenge. It's a grand challenge because of the requirements placed upon the material. Not only must they withstand temperatures hotter than molten lava, but simultaneously sustain enormous mechanical loads. At takeoff, the engines are spinning at 12,000 RPM, and the tips of the turbine blades are traveling at more than one and a half times the speed of sound. The stresses experienced by each blade is equivalent to hanging 15 hatchback cars to the end of each one. Each turbine blade generates more power than a Formula One racing car. And they need to endure these conditions for tens of thousands of flight hours. The sustainability of each metal is also critically important. We cannot design new materials that contain metals that are scarce or come from areas of conflict. We need to account for all these factors when designing new materials. The new materials we're interested in designing are new alloys. Alloys are mixtures of metals, sometimes with some non-metals thrown in. Almost all the metallic materials we use day to day are alloys. The most widely used alloy is steel, which is an alloy of iron and carbon. But other common examples include copper alloys like brasses and bronzes. The alloys we use in jet engines are called super alloys. They're very special alloys that we create by mixing different elements in nickel. They're called super alloys because they have exceptional properties, particularly at high temperatures. So great high temperature strength and resistance to corrosion. When we look at alloys on the atomic scale, it turns out that all the atoms are arranged in a regular plane or array. This is actually what defines something called a crystal, and there are many examples of crystals all around us. Things like quartz, diamonds, emeralds, but in fact also things like salt and sugar. Different alloys will have different atomic compositions in them and a different arrangement of the atoms in the structure. It's a bit like making a cake. It requires the same basic ingredients, but actually by changing which ingredients you use and the quantities you use them in, we can change the type of cake that you make. We build alloys from the ground up, starting by deciding what elements we want to use in the alloy by using the behavior in previous alloys. For example, chromium is added for corrosion resistance. This is what makes steel stainless. Once we have decided on the precise quantities we would like to use in the alloy, we then weigh out each element individually and melt everything together to form a bar. So once we have our alloy, it, we can then thoroughly investigate it for its properties. This usually involves a heat treatment in the furnace and preparing it for studying in the microscope. Using transmission electron microscopy, 
were able to map these alloys right down to the atomic scales and evaluate the contribution of each of the elements towards the structure and strength of these materials. We test our alloys at every step along the process. This goes from the moment we make those alloys all the way to the testing the, the mechanical properties. We need to make sure that those alloys have the right structure to have the best mechanical properties as well as making sure that they are stable over a long time at high temperature. This is how we guarantee that the alloys we make are safe to use and safe to carry people. So the way the atoms are arranged directly affects the way the engine performs. So to solve a global engineering challenge, we need to arrange atoms to produce even better materials. If we can arrange the atoms, we can control the properties and produce safe, sustainable air travel in the future. Team GB came to Bristol University in January of 2014 to ask us to help design their chain drive for the Rio Olympics to take place in 2016. The track bikes are the fastest bikes in the world that go up to 50 miles per hour and so every part of the bike must be fully optimised for speed. So we had to ensure that the chain and sprockets are efficient as possible at transferring the power from the pedals to the rear wheel. And even though the power loss is very small, it can still make the difference between winning or losing an Olympic race. So it was important to maximise the efficiency uh, so that we could get the best combination of chain and sprockets. One of the challenges of the project was having test rigs that were accurate enough for the Olympics. We did do a lot of endurance testing using a turbo trainer but we knew it was not accurate enough for measuring the slight differences in efficiency that we needed to identify the best component. So we needed a radical idea, a new super accurate test rig. One of the breakthroughs we had was to think of using a pendulum to measure efficiency. We realised that if we drove a chain drive with a swinging pendulum, then we could measure efficiency by monitoring how slowly the pendulum came to rest. We also realised that if we used a laser to measure the movement of the pendulum, then we could get extremely accurate results. You can see the test rig here, it has a chain and two sprockets. It also has a swinging pendulum. The laser is measuring how quickly the pendulum is slowing down and the swinging of the pendulum is shown on a screen. If the pendulum goes for a long time, then that shows we have a fast and efficient chain drive. But if the pendulum goes for a very short time, that shows that there's too much friction in the drive. We knew that it might produce some really surprising and interesting results, and it certainly did. As the sprockets got bigger, we noticed that the pendulum went for longer and longer, and that meant that larger sprockets were more efficient. This discovery was fascinating because it was really turning existing design rules on their head. For years, bike designers have been making sprockets smaller and smaller to save weight, but our tests were actually showing that larger sprockets can be much more efficient and best overall. In total, we spent two years carrying out testing and optimization of the chain drive. When the Olympics came, there was great excitement and anticipation. When we saw the bikes on live TV, then we knew this wasn't a dream, but a reality. One of the commentators was Chris Boardman and he immediately noticed the large sprockets uh, which was really nice and showed that they were making an impression. Team GB did incredibly well at the Rio Olympics, winning six golds, four silvers and two bronzes and setting two world records which was uh, an incredible achievement for one sports event. Of course Team GB's success was mainly down to the riders but they still rely on having the best, fastest bikes in the world. And to produce those, you need scientists and engineers. There were many people involved at Bristol University, including technicians, students, researchers, 
and lecturers, we were very proud to play a part in the success of the Rio Olympics. Surfaces are actually a, a, a key component on how bacteria can be transmitted through an environment. If you think about how you touch surfaces as you move around at home or maybe even in a hospital, you can think that it's very easy for you to touch a surface, pick up some bacteria, put it on another surface where somebody else can then touch and move the bacteria around and it can create a, an infective risk in uh, environments such as a hospital. In our research group we've got two main strands for looking at killing uh, microbes. One is to develop these light activated antimicrobial agents which uses ambient light around us with a special chemicals on a surface to be able to kill bacteria. Another method is to develop at surfaces where bacteria find it very difficult to stick in the first place. So that covers things like super hydrophobic surfaces. And that's very similar to what's done in nature with the so-called lotus effect, where water on a surface tends to roll and that rolling motion picks up the dirt, bacteria or viruses. We are working on surfaces that, uh, uh, whose uh, uh, dimensions are uh, very, very small, in fact, uh, on the nanometer scale. Uh, to give you an indication, uh, the, the, the human hair is uh, 10 microns, so we are working on uh, uh, structures that are 1,000 times smaller than these. We work with uh, surfaces that are inspired by nature. To give you an example, we are replicating some structures that exist in the eyes of moths, uh, and they look like nanopyramids. Some examples of applications are in smart decorative uh, paints. You could also see applications, particularly in things like boats and car manufacturers, where they'd like to have this sort of self-cleaning application within cars, but also in boats you could reduce the drag as the boat goes through the water. These light-activated antimicrobial surfaces show great potential to reduce hospital-acquired infections and to remove bacteria from devices such as mobile phones, uh, computer keyboards, and maybe even medical devices like uh, catheters. Superhydrophobic surfaces have a great future in self-cleaning materials and surfaces. We think these surface technologies can really revolutionise how we think about surfaces. The human body is very clever. When it gets injured, it repairs itself. But there are lots of things which we use every single day which easily get damaged. Now, we already have materials that can repair themselves, from car paint that can regenerate when it's scratched, or even concrete which can heal itself. But what happens if we could develop an advanced material which heals just like a human body? Our scientists at the universities of Reading, Oxford and Case Western Reserve are working collaboratively to research how polymers, which are the building blocks of plastics and resins, can actually regenerate and repair themselves, just like the human body. By designing in specific rebinding interactions at the atomic and molecular level, we found that small molecular chains can interact and grow into larger networks of chains. When the material is broken, the smaller chains have the ability to reassemble to reform the large network upon application of an external stimuli, such as heat or light. The material would have comparable properties to the pristine materials, as the chains remain intact and only the weak bonds are broken. We need to know how strong materials are in order to use them for real engineering applications. We use instruments such as this to measure that strength. It's important to do this before and after healing. The behaviour of polymers depends on how quickly we can deform them. By using these gas guns, we can deform materials at tens or hundreds of metres per second and then measure how they behave. Electron microscopes allow us to look at features smaller than a human hair. This allows us to understand how the damage is repaired on a more fundamental level. Materials that can self-heal, just like our body does, is a concept that is becoming more realistic every single day. In the future, we may be able to produce prosthetics and medical implants, which can repair themselves inside your body. We can even produce vehicles, which potentially could have self-healing properties, which could heal a crack within the vehicle before it can cause any damage to a passenger. Or buildings can be coated with a self-healing layer, which will defend it from environmental conditions and damage. So what does this research actually mean? Well, in the future, this technology could be applied to any plastic or any composite material, which is a very exciting prospect.